thing that we wanted with the world history was to have um, a little bit more robust Christian worldview, building a biblical worldview. So we've also added, so noted. Mm -hmm. And this author's point of view argues that there is a design, purpose, and pattern of history. As a matter of fact, history is nothing more or less than an unfolding of God's plan for the world. Today we're going to talk about the high school world history. Um, this has been, this, this set has been through a few revisions since I came. In fact, when I first, uh, <clears throat> Kristen was working as a uh, curriculum consultant 2012. We did a convention in Nashville, uh, and this was one of the products that was selling. It's had a few evolutions, if you will of product development and this newest one I think is really good. So uh, the original product was World History, uh, recommended for 9 through 12, probably World History would be um, like your 10th grade, 10th, to, 10th 11th, 12th grade would be where you would teach this. We have a few people jumping in, 8th graders and ninth graders. Awesome. Also, Laura jumped in on the Facebook Live and commented, hi, Laura. So we have a new American history as well. From In this series, we'll go over that here probably later this week or next week. Um, but we're going to start with world history. And this was the original course. Uh, the original course was in black and white. Kind of boring. Um, it, Yeah. Nice pictures, but it was black and white. Didn't do, didn't do a lot of appeal. Um, and then the questions were unique. The questions were very, uh, they were big and broad. So like Japanese women produce more art than their Western counterparts, why? Now I have a son who's really, he doesn't like a lot of words, but the words he chooses tend to have meaning. Mm -hmm. So he would answer that, Something to the effect of um, because the Japanese women were more artistic and took art more seriously. His answers were never like wrong and I couldn't really fault him even though it was only like a sentence. He answered it with a Twitter answer. Uh, it was just difficult. And a lot of the questions were kind of... Whoa! My audio we're one essay. I was double checking to make sure that all the Facebook comments were coming through. You can see a lot of the, the questions were like a big essay. And so he would, if he cared about it, he might write a paragraph or two, and maybe I should have made him. But um, so that, that was a bit of a problem. And, and for other kids like yourself, you took this uh, when you were in high school. I took the world history. Yeah. And mm -hmm. you didn't quite like the whole answers may vary. Answer key. No, I'm a black and white. Just tell me what to type out and. Tell me what you want me to think, and I'll think. Tell me what you want think. me to think. Well, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> but yeah, that, that was well. When you put it that way, I'm not like <laughs> that as much anymore. But yes. Yeah. Okay, so um, so what we've done is the new world history, of course, is more robust a little bit yeah it's got it's got a little bit more to it um it is in color wow yes a lot a lot more color actually the pictures are gorgeous i i know oh can i can i i haven't held this book yet that was out of the warehouse so it's got the you got a you gotta kind of spin it a little bit. It smells so. It does good. have a good smell. <laughs> All my books sniffing people. That's For funny. some reason, our books just have a certain smell to them. That when we get a new book, it's like the best smell. Yes. Now, one of the things this book has, which is unique, and I can't guarantee that it's going to be this way every time. We work with a lot of different printers, so. Um, we, we work usually to find printers that'll give a good bid and printers that'll get back product 
um, timely. And sometimes we're able to spec things with different printers and uh, that type of thing. This edition right now is a thicker book. What it has is a lay, right, lay flat binding where it's like this, the binding actually pulls apart and lays flat. And so this binding helps the page to lay more flat than a regular binding. Mm. Um, sometimes people will be like, oh, my book is defective because the binding's pulling away from the glue. Now this is actually meant to do this. And you can see how nice, how nice that book lays. Uh, we like it when we can do the lay flat bindings <coughs> just because the books do lay flat. And we're definitely getting much, um, I mean, the books are just getting more thick, yeah. thicker. Thicker getting, as we no more thick more thick thicker should it's I think they both they're work. getting thicker. Barbara asked, "What's with the book sniffing?" I don't get it. Old books, yes, but I'm not a new book sniffer. I didn't know some people just smell old books and not new books. I only smell new books. I don't like the older book smell because it has a sometimes it can have a musty a musty stale smell depending on where they've mm. been. So. Um, no, there's just I guess, a group of us who really like the smell of new books. I don't know. Our books, just the toner smells. It, has, it just smells so good. There's a nice... Yeah, this this book does have a good smell. I don't usually participate in this, but this one... Yeah, nice. he's always... You guys are weird. Laura, where's my the kindred book sniffer? Thank you. Pick up world history. <laughs> um, okay, so so we, we we... Another thing that we wanted with... The world history was to have um, a little bit more robust Christian worldview, building a biblical worldview. So we've also added So Noted. Mm -hmm. So Noted is um, it's the Henry Morris Study Bible, the book of Genesis with all of his notes and appendixes. And so um, if you don't know who Henry Morris is, Henry Morris wrote a book in the 60s, I believe, called the Genesis Flood. And the Genesis Flood was one of the, up until that time, there had been a strong attack on um, the, the biblical account of creation and the book of Genesis. And Henry Morris did, he was a geologist, and he looked at the evidence, and he said, no, the evidence of uh, fits a biblical model of the flood. And so he really became, they call him kind of the father of creation science. Creation science is science that, revolves around proving the biblical account of creation to be true. And it usually involves such thing as, um, you know, in the beginning God, right? But then you look at it through the book of Genesis and, um, and the flood, which we see evidence of mm -hmm. everywhere. So uh, we, yeah, I could go on and on about that. Henry Morris was, he is a class act and he was, his, his writings were just, I think we're brilliant. This Bible, we sell the Henry Morris Study Bible. We've sold thousands and thousands of those. Um, so noted was just the book of Genesis. And it's written in a way that it's like, um, you can actually take notes on it. The scriptures are on top. His study notes are on the bottom. And I've actually learned a lot from his study notes. Yeah, I went through part of it too. It's nice because you go through it, but his study notes are so deep that you can just one page of study notes can take you a while to work through because like i don't know i'll be like oh what does this word mean or what context is this word being used in and i end up bunny trailing all over the place so yeah it's really good good stuff mm -hmm. even the types and shadows he points out like when adam and eve created fig leaves covered themselves in fig leaves, his note, the hasty fabrication of a fig leaf aprons might conceal their procreative organs from each other, but could hardly hide their sin from God. Neither will the filthy rags and self-made righteousness cover sinful hearts today. The garments of salvation and the robe of righteousness can be provided only by God, just as God provides coats and skins for Adam and Eve. He, he does a lot of like notes and some are the word meanings and just yeah. um, a lot of evidence. So That's super deep. We, we use this and we use this to create worldview in this set. Um, the book of Genesis, I think is one of the strongest books for our uh, Christian worldview that we have in our culture. And when our students understand it, they're able to also talk about worldview. Uh, in the beginning, God. 
one of the most, the pivotal things. It's his creation. We're accountable to our creator versus in the beginning of bang and now man is here and all of creation revolves around me and my commands, understanding that God is at the center of creation. And so um, that, uh, he made them male and female. We have, we have gender, we have uh, be fruitful and multiply, the blessing of children and life. Um, we have, uh, he creates marriage and, and a man, one man and one woman uh, in marriage. And so we have these foundations, these worldview. We see what happens to a culture that obeys God and a culture who um, disobeys God and God's judgment. And uh, I think it's, it's a great foundation for building worldview. So uh, kind of going through the format, you're going to want the student book, So Noted. Now, So Noted isn't sold as part of the set because you may have a Henry Morris Study Bible or you may want to substitute with a Henry Morris Study Bible. Or maybe you bought So Noted in a flash sale. So rather than make people buy it again, we've made it um, a requirement of the course I mean, you could drop it if you wanted to, but I wouldn't recommend it at all. Um, but also, it would be, um, you can buy it individually or separately. Then we have the teacher guide, the new teacher guide to go along with this. Now, some of the changes that you're going to notice in this, let's see. Remember I showed you in the previous, let me show you again. In the previous teacher guide... Yep, pop that up. You would have one very broad question and then expected to write kind of essays or answers. This now, this study guide has uh, different formats. Um, you have multiple choice, true or false, and the essays. So short answers are worth 20 points. Define dualism. Uh, in Daniel 5, the prophet tells Belshazzar that because he worshiped other gods, he will be overthrown. What empire captured Babylon and ruled over it for two centuries? Um, see in the previous chapter. And so the, there's a little bit more variety in the questions and answers. Now, I do the scoring, a lot of the scoring for my, the students that Kristen and I have still at home. We have a son who just finished world history. Those essay questions it can be daunting to go through and try to understand. And then the answer key was answers may vary. These. <laughs> so then there's no, there's not even any good closure for us people who want answers. <laughs> right. And in, in these lessons, um, it still has answers may vary so that you know the answers aren't concrete, but you have all of the answers. And then like this says, answers may vary. The Bible says that all of sin fallen short of the glory of God. Christians should understand that all people are born into original sin, must experience the redemption, redemptive power of the cross. There is no other way that a just God could see imperfect people is virtuous. So it kind of gives you a summary of what yeah, That makes what it, it should easy like. to score because then you can have an idea of what the students should know without having to go back and read the chapter. Yes. So then the way we incorporate so noted is, let's see, on day 10, the assignment is creating a worldview. Uh, a worldview is the way a person sees, understands, responds to life from a philosophical position he or she embraces as his or home. Worldview is a framework that ties everything together, allows people to understand society and the world and their place in it. A worldview helps people make critical decisions that shape our future. Because of this, it is vital that you know and understand what it is you believe in and how it shapes your life and decisions. Each Friday for the rest of the year, except for Fridays with quarterly exams, you will be developing a biblical worldview based on your reading of Genesis. The final written assignment will be to present these worldview notes to your teacher for evaluation. You will be reading to be able to answer seven follow, the seven following questions. Um, so noted, pages 17 through 20, taking down notes to help you begin to define your worldview based on questions listed. You may choose to tear this page out and keep it with page 19 as you continue through the course. And so the page, um, what do you believe about the origins of the world? What do you believe about the past suggests about the world you live in today? How do these beliefs shape what you believe about tomorrow? In what way do your beliefs inform your thoughts and behavior about what is right and wrong? 
How do your beliefs impact the way you live and interact with people on a daily basis? How do your beliefs impact the way you live and interact with God on a daily basis? Why is it so important to know and understand the basis of what you believe? All right, so you see, you don't have to scroll very much of your Facebook feed right now to realize that thinking about our actions and forming worldview and teaching students to think about the worldview they have in contrast to a biblical worldview. Because when we look at a biblical worldview and we formulate that from Genesis and we begin to look forward and we compare it to what we see today in news and media and our social media posts, we say, wait a minute, man has completely removed God from the center of things. He's put his own interest and self in place of that. And humanism right now is running rampant. And we want part of history. Let me actually, part of history isn't just learning facts and figures. Let me see. Uh, okay. Let's see. History is remembering the consideration about why we have come so far. And there are two primary points of view about the way history is formed and thus remembered. One says that history is nothing more than arbitrary events connected by happenstance. The opposite point of view, and this author's point of view, argues that there is a design purpose and pattern of history. As a matter of fact, history is nothing more or less than an unfolding of God's plan for the world. It talks about how to evaluate history using documents and, and being discerning and all of that. So you can see how valuable it is that our students actually begin to create a biblical worldview and have um, the formation uh, to, to compare that to, rather than just understanding uh, a bunch of facts and figures. And so many times people will be like, um, you know, the history courses, history courses, that's what they want. Separate God from history. But history is the unfolding of his story, like the book says. And, and we want our students to understand that. And we also want them to learn from history because those who don't learn from their history are destined to repeat it. Um, a man who is now over 50 will tell you that when I haven't learned from my history, I've most definitely repeated it. And, and as a nation, it's kind of scary, isn't it? Because we're kind of going down that route. Okay, so um, I love, as I say, the color. We've got uh, the chapter overview, chapter three. Let me just see. I want to make sure I get the right. Katie said, hi, Brittany and Randy. We'll be using this course in the newly revised American History with my high schoolers this year. We are all excited. American History was my oldest son's favorite course last year, and he keeps telling his brother that you're going to love this course. Yeah, I, this course is so much stronger than, than the course you took. Oh, yeah. um, chapter overview. So chapter two, we'll begin with two important historical lawgivers, Moses and Hammurabi. Hammurabi? Hammurabi? Hammurabi. I'll say Hammurabi. <laughs> Next, we will discuss the concept of worldview. We'll employ a paradigm popular in the university to describe worldviews, theism, deism, romanticism, naturalism, realism, absurdism, and existential existentialism. <laughs> Good job. Finally, we'll study mighty, mighty King Nebuchadnezzar, conqueror of Judah. Readers should be able to read and understand the Ten Commandments, Compare Hammurabi's code with the Ten Commandments. Examine Jesus' statements about the Ten Commandments. Analyze the importance of Hammurabi's code to history. Discuss the meaning and importance of worldview and discernment. People and places that they're learning about and principles, Abraham, Amphrael, Euphrates, Moses, Nebuchadnezzar. 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 <laughs> it's a new soft drink. Uh, it's like GIF or GIF. Oh, you never say never connector. connector, I say never connector. <laughs> uh, Queen, <laughs> Nido Chris, and worldview. And we go through and talks about worldview, um, Moses, the Ten Commandments, the Code of Hammurabi, 
Uh, let's see. The War of Worldviews and the Eight Major Worldviews. Theism, God is personally involved with mankind. Deism, God was present but no longer is present. Um, Romanticism, God is or was nature. Naturalism, if God exists, he is pretty weak. Uh, Realism, a world with no purpose. Absurdism, there is no God nor any reason to have one. Existentialism, everything is relative. Postmodernism, rejection of objective truth. That's where we are. We're kind of in a postmodern uh, society. This would be a belief that is a tendency in contemporary culture characterized by the rejection of objective truth and a common cultural narrative. In other words, in postmodernism, every sacred, be- sacred belief and ethic is in question. <clears throat> Before postmodernism, the golden rule, for instance, was universally accepted and a desirable moral trait. Not in postmodernism. Everything is on the chopping block. The worldview emphasizes the role of language, power relations, and motivations. In particular, it attacks the use of classifications such as male versus female, straight versus gay, white versus black, the imperial versus colonial. Postmodernists avoid categories which, by definition, limit reality. Um, <clears throat> we, and then we study Nebuchadnezzar. And then we move into the Jewish exile. So uh, we wanted, we wanted, this moves quite quickly into Moses. And so by adding so noted, we're able to bring in the biblical history from creation right up to the time of Moses, which Genesis does perfectly. And so a student is gaining worldview, but gaining all of that biblical history at the beginning of this course, which I think I think it was lacking, and I think it needed to have a stronger foundation, but I think the scripture is actually the strongest place. We got mm-hmm. questions? Yeah, a couple. Um, Kelly Ash said, Hi, y'all. My 13 and 16 year olds will be doing Stobaz American History. Will y'all do a video preview like this for that course as well? We will. Yep. Either, probably, we'll, we'll fit one in this week. Amber asks, Have you said which history should be done first in high school? American history would probably fit. Um, If you went with the America story, world story, you would fit right into, like third grade would be third, fourth, and fifth grade would be America story. Sixth, seventh, and eighth would be world story. Then you would do American history in ninth, world history in 10th. Awesome, Beth said, good afternoon. Finally being able to catch a live. Welcome, hey, we've Beth. been waiting for you all this yep. time. We, we're we, like, we kept the light on. Yeah, where is Beth? Didn't show, didn't show, now you're here. Um, Jay's mama says, Brit is so pretty, oh, hashtag random. She, Thank you. She looks like I her father. I appreciate it. Yeah. We're pretty people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, I I doubt, it. I doubt that's where you get your good looks from. Okay. Um, Missy says that she thinks she wants it for herself. So does Barbara Dale want Yeah, I think, I think for a good overview of history, um, mm-hmm. I mean, it's very readable. And to be able to see, it, it connects people, big thoughts and ideas. Um, in the very back of this, actually, let's see. I'm going to come right up. In the very back of this book, of course, there's a glossary, which is nice. But then there is um, comparative worldviews. And so a student can keep this. We have agnosticism, uh, ancient Egyptian beliefs, ancient Greek beliefs, biblical truth. Agnosticism, what is an agnostic? Deny the certainty of the existence of God, but in various forms. They would generally reject the idea of divinity, the Trinity, and Jesus as the Son of God. Um, who is man in an agnostic worldview? Generally accept sin, generally accept an evolutionary view of man. No concept of a sinful nature. Man is a mortal being and part of the animal kingdom with no particular role in the universe. How does, how does an agnostic believe about sin? Sin is not generally part of an agnostic thinking. Though some would adopt certain cultural taboos, there is no view to judgment of sin since they reject the knowledge of deity. What about authority and revelation? 
most relevant, most reliant on materialistic empirical thinking with human reasoning coupled with a sense of perception being the ultimate standard of truth, reject any form of supernatural revelation, including the Bible. As far as salvation, an agnostic would say there's no concept of salvation apart from some cultural ideas, and they reject the need for Jesus. And so we have a biblical truth that we can contrast it to. through so many. Yeah. Sorry. Agnosticism. That's super cool. Buddhism, communism, Confucianism, deism, Druidism, Islam, humanism. Um, Hinduism. Germanatic or Norse beliefs. Stoicism, Shintoism, postmodernism, paganism, Judaism, um, Zoroastrianism. That's actually, you don't know this, but we used to live next to Zor Valley. That was. Um, oh, it tied originated into from them? Interesting. The people did. Um, yeah, Taoism. Around. So, so it's got all the different ones, kinds on the side, and then it goes through what each of them believe. So as you go through the book, there's different places where it'll tell you to go and look at comparative worldviews. So as you're studying um, uh, the Britons and dro druids, dro druids, druids, druids. Words are hard. D R U. Well, it is in these but cases. We're proud of you for trying. Okay, it says comparative worldviews. Compare and contrast biblical truth on the chart with druidism. Druid, Druidism, Druidism. <laughs> Druidism. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so then it gives you these, and it teaches it teaches students to evaluate different worldviews or, or religions based on how do they view God, how do they view man, how do they view sin, what about the authority of Scripture, and what about salvation? Which, when your student takes comparative um, religions, that's the same format that they use in, in when you're evaluating, say you're evaluating Mormonism. It's going to say, okay, when, when you're looking at Mormonism, how do you evaluate who is God in the Mormon religion? How is man in relationship to God? What about sin? What about authority revelation? What about salvation? And so it teaches them to be asking those questions. So if somebody says, well, we're the Baha'i faith, they can begin trying to dissect and say, okay, well, how does a Baha'i, uh, somebody who believes in Baha'i, how, how do they see God? Who is God to yeah, you? That's so interesting. I think I might, I'm going to take the PDF, the digital PDF, and print out that sheet. I Just that sheet studies. is awesome. Yeah. yeah. Okay, then we have, this, this will, neither did Carity. This will excite you too. Then we have eight major worldviews. And so we have theism, deism, romanticism, naturalism, realism, absurdism, existentialism, so, or, and postmodernism. So in postmodernism, we believe in the rejection of objective truth. In postmodernism, every sacred belief in ethic is in question. Um, where some examples of it are, H.G. Wells, Ludwig Whit Wittgenstein in chapter 36. Words. Yeah, so it gives a good idea. So that by the time they're done with history, they're not just seeing facts and figures or being told this is all, you know, this is the done from a Christian perspective. They're actually being introduced to different deisms mm -hmm. and beliefs that are interjected into cultures and the fact they had, but then they're also being asked to compare that to a biblical worldview. Exciting. Um, we have an instructor in Master Books Academy, Miss Summer King. She is doing, she is right now working to prepare a world history course as well. And I've gotten to see the beginning of it. And I think it's going to be phenomenal so that when students finish this course, they're going to have a rock solid biblical worldview. It's our happy dance. It is. I'm excited by it because to us, we, we don't just want. It's not about just facts and figures. If, you're, if your history course is just teaching facts and figures but not actually helping to shape a worldview, right? Because think about it. It's like, okay, your students, your students are going to be expected to leave your house and get into, say, a sailboat in a stormy ocean. If you don't prepare them for that, if you don't help them understand how to set the sail and how to tack and how to do... I know nothing about sailing, so I'm... I'm trying to come up with just a few you things. You could have fooled me. Yeah. See? If I didn't know that 
you don't know anything about sailing. I don't know anything about sailing. So if I if I did that and I just said, well, here's the sailboats, here's the parts, here's here's the way it is, but I don't actually teach them how to apply anything, then um, then I I would be doing them a big disservice, right? If I put them in a boat and said, Yahoo, you graduated, here's your thousand dollars, now go face the world, and we broke the bottle of soda over the bow and said, go get them. Um, what would happen the first the first storm they encountered? And they they might perish. They might determine bad ideas. We want to prepare them so that when they go into the world, they're going to be prepared. They're going to be able to say, "Wait a minute! I recognize that worldview." I think you know when we talk about topics like abortion, you know, we talk about contemporary issues that are going on in culture. What where are these things rooted? How do we how do we have a healthy perspective? And so I think it's really important that we begin having that. Um, and then when you couple it with the fact that Master Books Academy will also have some instruction that will thicken even more and bring some more to the worldview, um, it makes me really excited about this course. Any other questions? Yes. Um, Missy asked, my son did a different world, sorry, world history for ninth grade before we switched to Master Books. Should I have him do this or American history this year? So he did another what? World history. World history? Um, Ninth grade, if he's going into ninth grade, I would probably look at the American history and then save this for uh, for 10th grade and then look even at adding an elective of comparative religions uh, as an elective for to go alongside with world history. When you come out of it, you're going to be like, ba-boom. Yeah. Sarah asked, will there be any support or extras from the Master Books Academy, which you answered. Yep, working that. on that. Yep. Um, Mom23 Gal said, this is my first time watching it live. Our family is new, all new to Master Books. My kids are younger, um, but I'm loving everything I've been reading. It's encouraging to see such great materials they can learn as they grow. Yeah. Um, Hope asks, is this a one credit course or does the addition of So Noted add any additional credit, maybe for Bible? In my state, credits are earned by hours, 120 for one or book completion. Right. It's set up for one. I mean, it's set up as a one credit course. Um, you could certainly, I think you could add um, some Bible, especially if you added a little bit to it. You could do a half an elective or half a credit of, mm -hmm. of Bible to it if you did some journaling and um, some additional type stuff right. uh, but it's not it's designed to be 180 days you know uh, one credit Jay's mama asks how does this book differ from your worldview and conflict course worldview and conflict is more um, it's some authors say like Mark Twain or Karl Marx and and it it talks about those individuals but it doesn't show the big context of history and history, the way it's woven in, you have, you know, history isn't just one group of people. You have multiple people groups and history is all occurring at the same time. It's what I love about Adam's chart. Our Adam's chart folds out to 23 feet long and would be a great complement to this course. I don't think I have one in here. Um, we've done other videos on it though. Uh, it's 23 feet long and you can see from creation to the 1900s and you can see like, Okay, while well, Jesus is dying on the cross, over here they're building, um, you know, London is, is beginning to be built. And, and you see that history is occurring all the time in multiple threads. But history is also like a tapestry that's being woven in and out of each other. So world history especially, like when you study American history, it can be fairly linear. But when you're studying world history... It's it's kind of all over the place as you start bringing things together. Yeah, Skittle said, wow, that's so cool. Very good for visual people. Definitely. Yeah. Um, Sarah said, now that the British history course is in the world history, should my student take the new world history even though we did the previous version? Uh, good question. <laughs> I, I think the new world history is head and shoulders above the last world history. So I would look at the preview and think, see if you think that the information that they would be learning would be something more valuable. And maybe you could even determine what, you know, 
maybe you go through it a little bit faster and accelerate a rate or you add something to it. Um, but you know, you probably already assigned one credit to, to world history. So it's more, if you felt that the worldview would be valuable that that's added to this course. Um, I don't know that I would say you have to, you would, you know, mm -hmm. you're not going to gain, you're going to gain some British history in it because we took that course and combined it. But I don't think that it's going to be enough that I would say redo the course because of that. Right. Um, and I said we loved using the Adams chart with world's history. Yeah, the Adams chart is fantastic to go and try to identify. You actually learned a lot about the Adams chart because you did a promotional video on it. It's good. It's really cool when you get into it. Um, and very good for visual people because I'm very visual. Yeah. Um, Christy said, yeah, I was wondering about the revised history, especially in comparison to world story and doubling up to make it a high school credit. Okay. So when it comes to world story, my recommendation is world story is appropriate for um, upper elementary, junior high. I think that this course introduces philosophies that are not going to be introduced in world story. Mm -hmm. So while it may teach some concepts of history, it was designed to be taught to students what a student could handle in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. And, um, and I think that, that you, there's benefit to understanding the, the deisms and theisms of history and how they affect us today, mm -hmm. as well as some culturally relevant topics and the way they're presented um, in this book. And I think the heart still of the book is allowing a student to see the information and kind of guided shaping of a worldview. Um, Mrs. Gillert said, Aussie here, what age is upper elementary, please? Well, the upper elementary for um, world story would be to start in sixth, seventh, and eighth. This world history, would be, I think on the teacher guide, it says 10 through 12. Um, Barbara Ash, she said, before the update, I saw that these high school history courses partnered with the literature courses. Is it still that way? Am I understanding it right? How does it work? They, they do go alongside with the literature courses. The literature courses are fairly robust um, and they have not been made over. They haven't been updated. So you can use them with that. It's, it's not a requirement to do it. Um, if you do, there's still quite a bit of writing in that. Uh, and you could, so you could have a literature that would coincide with world history, but it hasn't specifically been updated yet to, for this. Um, Michelle said, do you always recommend doing American history before world history? My son will begin 10th grade this fall and did world geography for ninth grade. No, I think you could go into, you could do world history and then do American history after. Awesome. And then Chrissy asked, any idea on when the master books revision of a child's world will be out? I'm looking at it for our upcoming year, but would love to have the master books lay out. So I'm assuming that's a knowledge quest. I'm assuming so. Book. Um, I think they're slated for, to, for the team to begin pulling them apart in this fall. Uh, but I know due to, you know, the COVID and everything else, their schedules got a little bit messed up because almost everybody but a handful of us worked from home. And it just, some projects dragged out. So um, my guess is that will be available we're looking more at the 2021 school year mm -hmm. than right now. They're more available. Awesome. That's that it. concludes my questions. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you guys for chiming in and joining the conversation. Yeah. I enjoy reading through everything. Yeah, it's it's fun to see the, the interactions. Um, we have a fair amount of new people who are homeschooling. And so uh, I think... Rachel did a segment last Thursday on standardized testing. One of the other things that I've asked her to do, she was, uh, she was involved in kind of a cover school where she lived and uh, had a lot of experience in helping build transcripts and helping kids take the, the, cat, or the ACTs and SAT tests and helping them enroll into college if that's the track that they wanted. So I've asked her to use the um, cumulative record kit and do another teaching in that 
HSA, HSLDA.org. If you're not a member, highly recommend it. Um, one of the reasons, Homeschool Legal Defense Association, their website has a lot of information, a lot of articles. They have how to homeschool through high school. They have how to build a transcript. Uh, they just have a lot of great information. They also, if you become a member, and I think it's like $100 or $120 a year for a family, uh, they will provide legal representation. So I have a card in my wallet. If for some reason one of my kids was out jumping on the trampoline at 10 o'clock in the morning and a neighbor called and said uh, his kids are always truant and protective services showed up, I would call HSLDA and they would be my legal representation. And um, we've used them in the past for schools. Uh, sometimes a school would overreach and say, you need to give me this, this, and this. So we would contact HSLDA, make sure that we understood what the requirements were for our state. And sometimes they would even send a letter saying, um, you know, just kindly, hey guys, we know you're, you're being diligent to collect all the information in this state. These isn't required. Um, and so we have used them quite a bit over the years just to make sure that everything we did was, um, was good, you know? And um, so we highly recommend that. And I think coming up in the future, there may be some more legal challenges and battles that come up in different states. And I think it's great to be supporting um, an organization that's so devoted to uh, protecting us legally. Okay. So a little bit of information on how to build high school. Uh, typically, you'll see the transcripts. It's three to four uh, courses for high school, um, high school history or social studies, uh, American history. Like you could do American history, world history. Um, you could you could maybe do a comparative religions, like a history of comparative religions mm -hmm. or worldviews and conflict where you're doing some historical literature and foundations um, and then you would do civics and, and which would be the constitution mm -hmm. and economics uh, usually those are each half a semester so that'd be your fourth your four uh, four credits mm -hmm.